الرحيم بإذن الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله I would like first of all to welcome everyone to this small seminar and symposium about locally advanced lung cancer Before we go on into the program I would like to thank Ahmed Munir and AstraZeneca company for their tremendous support and commitment to the scientific societies and to this meeting in particular. Uh, it couldn't صراحة, happen without their uh, generous support. So uh, many, many thanks for uh, their uh, support and fund. And, uh, I also would like to thank everyone who worked uh, for this collaboration to happen, including Dr. Brahim al Omari for his coordination and, and uh, organization, Dr. Uh, Amin and everyone else who coordinated uh, this kind of collaboration. And uh, of course, I'd like to thank the scientific committee and faculty for building the program uh, and uh, the faculty for being there for moderating sessions and preparing the uh, presentations. And inshallah, today you will enjoy this uh, session. It will go through two main parts, from management to clinical scenarios. A very interesting, uh, uh, comprehensive uh, program. I'm sure we'll learn a lot and we'll have a lot of interactive discussions, inshallah. So without uh, further ado, I would like to hand it uh, to uh, my senior colleague, and my uh, yani beloved uh, uh, mentor in life and in radiation oncology, our senior, Dr. Adnan al Hibshi, who is a senior uh, radiation oncologist who taught most of uh, attendees <laughs> here and who showed us the uh, early uh, uh, yani ABCs of radiation oncology. Today, he will moderate uh, the, the first uh, session, inshallah. Go on, Dr. Adnan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. al Atain, for this nice introduction. I am just part of you. I am the new blood in radiation of oncology. Really created the impossible. Thank you very much. Starting from you, Ibrahim al Atain, Saru Group, and uh, Dr. Ibrahim al Umari. Uh, so it's uh, just let us start. Really, I'm enjoying this session. And uh, the first presentation will be by Dr. Ibrahim Al Umari, consultant radiation oncology at Princess Nora Cancer Center at National Guard Hospital, Jeddah, one of the well equipped, well staffed department. I worked in this department, very busy. Dr. Ibrahim Al Umari graduated his medicine uh, uh, medical school from King Abdulaziz University Hospital. He did his postgraduate studies at the University of Ottawa, and he did also the fellowship. He is one of the seniors in colorectal cancer, lymphoma, as well as lung cancer. Dr. Ibrahim al Amari will present the management overview of the lung cancer. Please, Dr. Ibrahim al Amari, we are starving for this topic. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you so much, uh, Adnan Ibrahim, for uh, this event. Thank you, Adnan, for the introduction, and now, I'll just share my uh, presentation, and I hope that, uh, can you see it? Yes, Hi. very clear. Um, what I will, uh, you know, it's a very tough topic to uh, compress trial modality management of local advancement and small cell lung cancer in 20 minutes. I'll, I'll try my best. I'll try to be um, short and uh, to the point. So first thing is we have to achieve an accurate stage. And usually that starts by seeing a patient in the clinic, having a history and physical, asking for the imaging, CT cap, MRI brain, PET scan, then having histopathology from the primary and the model. And once we achieve that, we can stage the patient. This is the AGCC 8 edition. Uh, we'll focus today on stage three. As a radiation oncologist, we focus more on 3A. Our medical oncologists, you know, focus on other three A, B, and C. Okay, we have some rule in three B, and uh, we will touch uh, based on that. It's very important to have to know the stage because we know that you know the outcome, the survival depends on the stage. The earlier the stage, the better the outcome. 
clinically or pathologically. Unfortunately, many of our patients present late. And as you can see, 57% of all patients present with distance metastasis. So we still have a lot of challenges to uh, change that uh, you know, um, <clears throat> graph. So I'll just talk a little bit about radiation techniques. So when we treat the tar you know, a moving target, we have to keep that in mind. The problem is when you treat lung cancer, the tumor and your volumes moves. So you have to keep that in mind. And uh, what do you do? You try to maneuvers to uh, you know, encompass that moving target. We increase our volumes and uh, contour the full uh, range of mov movement in that uh, tumor. We use accelerator beam gating where patient breathe normally, beam on while patient is on a certain phase of the respiratory cycle. Active breath hold technique, patient hold breath in certain position, beam is only on on that phase or we track basically using uh, you know, uh, tumor uh, as, as a, you know, as a target and beam always on when the, you know, the tumor moves. And we can achieve that by having, you know, infra camera tracks uh, the motion of uh, reflective markers measuring the respiratory patterns and excursion. Uh, CT scan is correlated with respiratory trace and the respiratory trace divided into eight to 10 respiratory phases. And having all that information in our CT sim, we can, uh, you know, easily, you know, draw our targets. We have to keep in mind that, you know, when we treat locally advanced uh, non-small cell lung cancer, our volumes are large. Uh, usually we try to encompass primary tumors plus the marginal arms plus some nodes if it's involved. And to achieve that, uh, we have to keep in mind that we are in a closed proximity to normal structure. So we either decrease our dose per fraction to give time for the uh, DNA repair by using lower dose per fraction, 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction in 30 fractions, uh, or using you know techniques like IMRT and DMAT to shape the dose. We have to keep uh, our organic risk at bay. So we have to know the, our numbers and we keep them uh, you know, uh, always, always under the uh, appropriate doses. So management of uh, locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer. The, basically, this is a trimodal treatment, surgery, system treatment, and radiation. And there are factors that affect the treatment choices patient factors, disease factors, and you know, um, uh, uh, physician factors. Performance status is very important factor. Stage, susceptibility versus operability. And more recently, molecular testing, our colleague in medical oncology are very, very interested in knowing the molecular status before starting treatment because that may alter their treatment plans. It's very important to uh, discuss each and every patient uh, in a multidisciplinary approach, having all involved uh, services around the patient, uh, patient-centered uh, care. And that is being shown to have a survival advantage in a, a single institution analysis. There were an overall survival benefit when patient get discussed in multidisciplinary team compared to patient who did not. All right, so let's talk about treatment. So stage 2B and 3A. Those patients who have higher lymph node. Sorry. Uh, usually, for those patients, surgery is the treatment of choice. And the preferred uh, you know, local treatment if patients are medically and surgically operable. So, all patients will require adjuvant chemotherapy afterward. And sometimes we use new adjuvant therapy if a patient is surgically unresectable up front or in cases of uh, pancreas uh, superior sulcus tumor. Usually, uh, if patients are unresectable or inappropriate for whatever reason, we go for uh, you know, concurrent chemo radiation 60 grades. And we have, to, we have to keep in mind that there are some frail patients who cannot withstand concurrent chemo radiation. And in those patients, we may end up choosing sequential chemotherapy, radiation alone, or other uh, altered fractionation based on the situation at hand. What do we do with the mediastinal lymph node positive disease, stage 3A and uh, some of 3Bs? 
We know that the overall survival for stage 3A is 20%, while it's 10% for 3B. And we know that there is a high chance of distant metastasis at presentation. So we have to keep in mind optimizing local regional control with minimizing morbidity, because many of these patients, unfortunately, are likely to be cured, and many of them have poor health. Surgery is not the choice here. So you have to keep, you know, your surgeons have at bay when you're talking about, you know, stage three A and B. Sometimes we may need them, but we have to, you know, uh, keep them under control because surgeons sometimes can go wild and they, as always, surgeons think they can cut anything. We have studies, a multiple randomized trial showed that surgery had no survival benefit, but well-selected group may benefit. So this is why we have to discuss all those patients. And the treatment options for those patients usually are definitive chemo radiation, or if surgery is possible, new adjuvant chemo or chemo radiation followed by surgery. So I always like to have a slide or two about the fractionation. Where did it come from? So this is an RTOG trial uh, that randomized 375 patients stage 3 A and B to 40 gray and 20, 40 gray and 10 fraction split course, 15, 25, and 60 and 30. Basically, the higher the dose, the better the outcome. Unfortunately, all patients develop distant metastasis. And that trial told us that radiation alone is not enough and we need something else. And this is the uh, where the chemo radiation came from. If we have, you know, special group of uh, our special cancer types that need special attention. And this study looked at that specifically. The intergroup 0160, it is a phase two that looked at uh, one, 111 patient with severe sulcus tumor. And after concurrent chemo radiation, they got restaged. And for non-progressors, they went for surgery, then two more cycles of chemo. If they progress, they go for definitive uh, radical chemo radiation. And that trial show, showed us that 86% of those patients had surgery. So chemo radiation down stage tumors to a resectable stage. And 56% of them had pathological complete response. And as well, it showed us that most common site of relapse is brain. And that brought the idea of prophylactic cranial irradiation in non-small cell lung cancer. And there were multiple trials. Unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about them because they need a session by itself for that uh, topic. Then we had the intergroup 0139, which randomized 396 patients, stage 3A, to new adjuvant chemo radiation, uh, giving 45 gray, then surgery versus definitive uh, chemo radiation. Uh, to 63 gray. That trial showed the median survival and five years or, or, or <clears throat> overall survival was the same. The uh, median progression free survival and disease free survival was better in new adjuvant followed by surgery compared to definitive chemo radiation. But that was on the expenses of higher related uh, death um, and mortality. And if we look at a subset analysis, we see that there were almost 18% patients who had pathological complete response after new adjuvant chemotherapy, which predicted higher overall survival. Patients who were going for lipectomy did better after new adjuvant chemotherapy, but patients who went for pneumonectomy did worse. And 26 cases were patients who had uh, new adjuvant uh, chemo radiation followed by pneumonectomy. So for patients who are going for pneumonectomy, uh, don't give chemo radiation. They either go for pneumonectomy, uh, if it's a localized disease, or radical chemo radiation. So the conclusion from that trial was basically both approaches remain valid, and you have to keep in mind that this is for 3A. German trial looked at induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation, then surgery with radiation boost for inoperable or R1, R2 uh, disease versus surgery followed by chemo radiation. There were no difference in uh, five years overall survival or progression-free survival. 
preoperative uh, chemo radiation improved complete pathological response and uh, mediastinal down staging. And that became, I think, one of the uh, leading trial in, in advocating for new adjuvant chemo radiation. And basically this is what we do in our center. The URTC08941, randomized 579 patients with unresectable N2 disease to receive three chemo, three induction chemo, and then based on um, staging, non-progressor after chemotherapy randomized to surgery versus chemo radiation. Unfortunately, in this trial, we know that the radiation arm used older techniques and include elective nodal irradiation, which later on uh, we, uh, we will see that, you know, elective nodal irradiation is detrimental. Uh, surgery arm had almost 50% of the patient going for pneumonectomies. The result did not show any difference in five year overall survival, uh, media survival or progression free survival. There were basically higher treatment related mortality with surgery and fewer local regional failures when you treat with chemo radiation. So that trial showed that surgery did not improve survival or progression free survival. And given the low morbidity and mortality, radiation, chemo radiation basically should be the preferred modality. Then came the 0617. This is a major you know, randomized control trial. We're looking at dose escalation plus cetuximab. So patient with newly diagnosed unresectable stage 3 A, B, non-small cell lung cancer, randomized to four arms, 60 gray uh, plus or minus cetuximab versus 74 gray plus or minus cetuximab. There were no difference in outcome, more esophagitis basically in the higher dose radiation and more toxicity, grade three toxicity with cetuximab. So this trial showed that 60 gray uh, without cetuximab is the standard of care for those probe patients. For post-op uh, therapy, we have the, you know, the famous uh, port meta-analysis, which looked at uh, many, many random control trial and showing that there are absolute 7% absolute detrimental effect uh, if you use post-operative radiation for stage one, two, and zero in one disease. As for stage three or N2, there were no clear evidence. So that trial told us that elective nodal irradiation is a no-no, you only treat if you have a positive margin, N2 disease, or if you have an N1 disease where patient is not fit for chemotherapy. And then came the Pacific trial. This, I would say, changed our uh, treatment algorithm in locally advanced and resectable non-small cell lung cancer. So for patients with a stage three, locally advanced and resectable non-small cell lung cancer, who uh, received uh, concurrent chemo radiation, followed uh, randomized after one to 42 days to the Valumab, uh, Q2 uh, weeks for 12 months compared to placebo. And their co-primary uh, endpoint was progression-free survival and overall survival plus other uh, secondary uh, you know, um, endpoints. I go. Sorry, my... Yeah, so as you can see, both uh, primary endpoints were met. And I would say that this trial changed our approach to unresectable local regional management of non-small cell lung cancer. Enough evidence go to toxicity. So the toxicity depend mainly on the location and the size of the primary tumor and the uh, involved lymph node and what type of chemotherapy, the performance status of the patient. But uh, the um, majority of acute toxicity we see during radiation is acute esophagitis, usually three to four weeks into treatment. And it is dis distinguishable from uh, thrush and acid reflux. And usually we use PPI, mouthwash, and analgesics. Fatigue is well known and usually we treat with exercise and rehab, rehab and look for other treatable causes, dry and unproductive cough, skin discomation. 
radiation pneumonitis is an acute acute delayed toxicity usually develops within uh, one to 12 months post radiation median is three to six months and usually it's asymptomatic radiological finding it can be in 10 to 20 percent of patient usually productive cough short of breath chest pain malaise uh, plus or minus fever and on ct you use the patchy alveolar ground glass consolidation PET scan may show some metabolic activity. Usually it's self-limiting, but in some patients we may use prednisone for two weeks and then we taper it slowly. Lung fibrosis is a long radiation toxicity that we see uh, basically more or less with the old techniques. And usually it occurs in area where prior subacute pneumonitis happen and at the high radiation dose region. Uh, you see it on X-ray as a visible line correlated to the isodose distribution. It's a pathognomonic diagnostic. Uh, it can affect the quality of life. And unfortunately, there are no treatments. Refracture in two to 3% of uh, patient treated. And usually it happens within the high dose area, 18 to 20 months after treatment. Stricture, sophageal stricture happens to two, one to 2%. Two it occurs in three to four years post radiation. And usually we just use, we dilate the esophagus. And unfortunately, injury to the heart, pericarditis, ischemia, effusion, uh, coronary artery disease. If you look at the guidelines, there are so many. I mean, this is the NCCN guidelines, 15 medical oncologists, nine surgeons, five radiation oncologists, and hundreds and hundreds of pages of, you know, guidelines that, you know, includes everything from the highest, the level of uh, evidence to the uh, you know uh, doctor experience we are lucky in astro as uh, the radiation oncologist to have a very focused guidelines and these are the guidelines available for pay people who are treating lung cancer palliative radiation therapy for small cell lung cancer stereotactic body radiotherapy uh, guidelines for treating small cell lung cancer and guidelines for treating adjuvant and definitive uh, non-small cell lung cancer. It's very, it's really, really good to read, and it comes in, you know, question-answer evidence-based format. So, just to wrap up, uh, this is an NC, uh, C, in, uh, you know, uh, recommendations uh, regarding the dose of radiation uh, used, depending on whether it's definitive, preoperative, or postoperative. You can see that they still use 70 grade. Although trials showed that you know higher doses uh, has no uh, you know benefits, but it's still there. So for definitive radiation, I would go for 60 gray. For preoperative radiation, I would go for 45 to 50 gray. Postoperative, depending on the reason, for negative margins, uh, N2 disease 50 to 54 extracapsular nodal extension or microscopic positive margin 54 to 60 gray. Gross, gross residual tumor is 60 gray. You have to keep a, you know, a look at the organ at risk and keep them you know, uh, at bay and know your numbers well. Uh, we have to know that you know, total dose administered is just a number. You know, if you can give a higher dose of radiation you know, safely without affecting your organ at risk, you know, you could go up to 70. I would not recommend it, but uh, this is what they recommend. As, and pulmonary risk increase if you are treating lower lobes. So if you're treating lower lobes, be careful because the volumes of lungs you are treating is huge. And with this, I end my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brahim al Omari, for this. Uh, first of all, to stick to the time. This is rare in, in, in other specialties. And uh, we are radiation oncologists. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just I want to do one comment uh, in your presentation regarding the uh, preoperative radiation therapy. How many times you do the preoperative uh, and the surgeon will tell you, sorry, I cannot operate in this case? And you feel <laughs> sorry that you didn't give the patient the full dose. You know what I yeah. did? In yeah. my practice, I used to give 60 and I would tell them this is 45. And he would go <laughs> Yes, actually, it's not my, uh, my, my suggestion or advice. It was advice in one of the afternoons. 
you, you should give 60 gray because most of the surgeons sometimes uh, refuse to do surgery. I asked Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Khalid Qatan to join us. I hope he will catch up. Uh, so oh, this yeah. is, <laughs> he's here? Yeah. He's here. Oh, MashaAllah. Good. I like it. Now we can uh, fight. Uh, sorry, we can. Uh, <laughs> I like We, we this already fight with... about the Pacific Trial so many times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 so uh, let's go to the next. Uh, so you know my trick now, Dr. Khalid I will give the full dose before you go to surgery. So the no, next. I, uh, no, for us, but just one second. I, I think for us, I don't mind 60 grade and do the surgery. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I think patients who uh, potentially unresectable should take full dose of concurrent chemo radiotherapy. Do not compromise because a chance that he may be a good responder and become a surgical candidate. Yeah. But if the surgery is already well planned before, yeah, you give 40. Yeah, sure. But uh, not, then I give full dose, reassess, and if the tumor responded quite well uh, and this patient can go for less than the pneumonectomy, I will go ahead and uh, do a lobectomy after uh, ray, uh, 60, but not after four weeks from radiation. There's a window where the, uh, you can actually have more safe surgery within three weeks after the last dose of radiation, uh, even if it is 60 grade. I, I agree to uh, Prof. Qattar, and this is what we adopt in King Faisal. We discuss it over and over uh, in the thoracic uh, uh, oncology tumor board, and yeah. our surgeons are, ve are very comfortable in treating after 60, and we don't see extra uh, morbidity like uh, uh, a bronchopleural fistula or ARDS, uh, but this is our practice. Thank you very much all. Thank you, Dr. Khal Qatan, for joining us. I'm really very happy. Dr. Khal Qatan, professor of thoracic surgery. I worked in radiation oncology and he was the first Saudi thoracic surgeon I knew when I started my residency. Thank you very much for joining us. And Dr. Amin al Amir, my colleague as a moderator, and he will introduce the next speaker, Fahad Rwais. Please, Dr. Amin al Amir. Amin, are you with us? Hello, can you hear me, guys? I cannot hear anybody. Please, Dr. Masmo, Dr. Adnan. I'm not sure if Dr. Adnan is muted. Okay. So, sorry about this. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much, Adnan. Thank. Uh, our next speaker is uh, well known to most of you, Dr. Fahad Rwais, uh, and he's going to talk about definitive treatment, radiotherapy, and systemic therapy. Uh, Dr. Fahad, please. Uh, we cannot hear you, Dr. Fahad. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this topic. Uh, this is an overview of uh, the talk today. We'll start with some introduction and then uh, generally management of uh, resectable stage three. Uh, and then the unresectable stage three disease will go over the, how did the treatment evolve over years from RT to concurrent, uh, to sequential then concurrent chemo RT. And then we'll discuss different way of treatment intensification, including uh, trimodality therapy, the use of induction or consolidation chemotherapy, and more recently, uh, consolidation with immunotherapy. And uh, at the end, we'll have some uh, conclusion. So approximately about 30% uh, of patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer have advanced stage three disease. Uh, this subset of patient is a highly heterogeneous group of uh, patient and the prognosis is uh, very variable as you can see here uh, in the curve. Uh, data supporting treatment approaches in specific patient subset often subset, uh, subject to a number of uh, limitation. Many trials were uh, underpowered and include really a heterogeneous uh, group. So we'll start with the resectable stage three disease. 
this is de defined at least as per the ASTRA as a subset of stage three patient that can undergo definitive resection uh, to ensure uh, appropriate surgical resectability, adequate pulmonary reserve, and acceptable uh, medical operability uh, risk. Uh, these groups usually include T1 to T3, N0 to N1 disease. And for the most part, when we reach N2 and T4 disease, usually the role of surgery become uh, less relevant as we'll see later. Uh, now, if you see a patient who underwent uh, resection for a stage three disease, and you want to discuss with him the adjuvant therapy. Uh, this includes uh, three uh, options, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or targeted therapy. Uh, the role of adjuvant chemotherapy was evaluated in a multiple randomized controlled trial and uh, subsequently also a meta-analysis that showed uh, improvement in overall survival by about uh, 5% uh, with the adding of therapy surgery and there was no heterogeneity of the chemotherapy effect among these uh, uh, these trials what about the role of adjuvant uh, radiotherapy the role of adjuvant radiotherapy was a subject of debate uh, all data showed that it might be detrimental maybe subset of uh, patient with n2 disease may benefit and uh, recently, we have the lung art trial, uh, which was only presented as an abstract in the ESMO 2020. Uh, this is a phase three randomized control trial that compared post-operative radiotherapy to a dose of 54 gray versus uh, uh, no RT, uh, included patient with complete resection with nodal exploration and pathology proven in two disease with performance status zero to two. The primary endpoint of this trial was disease-free survival with multiple secondary endpoints, including overall survival. Uh, the trial included about 500 patients that were uh, recruited in the period between 2007 and 2018, almost a decade. Uh, most of them were PET staged and uh, most patients received uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. The median follow-up is about five years. And basically, uh, there was no statistically significant difference in disease-free survival, although numerically the number were in favor of radiotherapy, and there was no difference in uh, overall uh, survival. What about the adjuvant use of uh, targeted therapy? Uh, the ADORA trial is a phase three randomized control trial that compared the use of adjuvant uh, third generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor or simertinib for three years versus placebo. Uh, it did include patient with stage 1b to 3a non small cell lung cancer completely resected with EGFR mutations. The primary endpoint of this trial was progression free survival among patients with stage 2 to 3a. Uh, secondary endpoint included uh, progression-free survival in the whole group as well as overall survival. Uh, included uh, over 600 patients in the period between 2015 and 2019. And uh, the outcomes in 24 months did show that in patients with stage 2 to 3A, 90% uh, uh, in the group that received osimertinib versus 45% were alive and disease-free with a statistically significant difference. You can see uh, clearly here that the curves are separating with hazard ratio of uh, one, uh, 0.17. The trial also did show that uh, decreased incidence of uh, CNS relapse. Uh, the data for overall survival still immature. The overall death is less than 30 patients. So we don't know uh, the result of overall survival. Previous trial that evaluated all generation TKI improved progression phase survival, but not overall survival. So how about the uh, patient with unresectable stage three disease? Uh, historically, until the 1980s, radiotherapy alone was the standard of care for unresectable uh, disease. The RTOG 7301 evaluated different dose level 
and there was basically no difference in overall survival, but the best local control achieved with uh, 60 gray. The uh, long-term out, uh, outcome is poor with uh, only about 15% remain alive at three. So to further improve outcome, the combination of chemo-RT was evaluated in different randomized control trial, first in sequential setting. This is an example of one of the trial, the cancer and leukemia group B that evaluated the uh, role of sequential chemotherapy with cis plus 10 versus radiotherapy alone to a dose of 60 gray. And it did show improvement in overall survival from less than a year, about nine months to about 14 months. Different trials subsequently compared sequential versus concurrent. And uh, meta-analysis also uh, confirmed uh, statistically significant benefit of about 5% at three year overall survival. Of course, this comes at the cost of increased toxicity with higher grade three esophagitis of about 20%. The different, there was no uh, statistically significant difference in uh, pneumonitis between sequential and concurrent chemo RT. Uh, how about the use of tri-modality therapy in, with surgery, chemo and RT? There are different randomized control trials that evaluated the role of three modality treatment. Uh, these trials uh, were conducted in different time frame with heterogeneous group, different primary outcome. Uh, many of them were, uh, were underpowered. The, this trial, for example, and uh, that one compared the use of uh, concurrent chemo RT uh, to be followed by surgery or continuation to definitive chemo RT. The trial here compared the use of surgery uh, with or without pre-op chemo or chemo uh, RT. Uh, this trial uh, did not include PET staging. These two did include. Uh, overall, none of these trials showed statistically significant improvement in overall uh, survival. Uh, this trial did show improvement in progression-free survival, but was not enough to translate into overall survival. In fact, mortality was higher for those who underwent uh, nominectomy. So what do we learn from uh, these trials? Basically in stage 3A, patient with N2 disease and stage 3B randomized control trial have not shown that two modality treatment are better than one local treatment. And regardless of the local treatment received, overall survival remain the same. As such, the standard of care for most of those patients is concurrent chemo RT. How about the use of neoadjuvant or consolidation chemotherapy after uh, concurrent chemo RT? Different trial compared the use of uh, induction chemotherapy with a different agent. And although initially small phase two trial showed promising result, this did not translate into any meaningful uh, overall survival improvement. And the same also applied for the use of uh, consolidation or adjuvant uh, chemotherapy after completion of concurrent chemo RT. What does the guideline say? Uh, basically, there is no proven rule of routine use of induction chemotherapy prior to uh, chemo RT. And there are no phase three data specifically supporting the role of consolidation chemotherapy after chemo RT for the improvement of overall survival. However, in specific case, if you are dealing with a quite advanced disease that you are unable to meet your dose constraint, or if you are dealing with you know, quite advanced disease, multiple contralateral lymph nodes, and the patient is very high risk of metastasis, the use of induction chemotherapy might help for better selection of patients that are more likely to uh, benefit from this treatment modality. Uh, many, uh, for example, uh, surgical trials usually exclude patients who progress uh, after neoadjuvant or induction. How about the rule of uh, dose escalation of uh, radiotherapy? Uh, we have the RTOG0617. This is a randomized uh, phase three, two by two study included patient with stage 3A, 2B non-small cell lung cancer with the primary endpoint of overall survival. Uh, patient were randomized between standard dose of 60 and 74 with concurrent carbotaxel 
uh, with or without cetuximab, both on received consolidation carbotaxel with or without uh, cetuximab. Uh, most of the patients in this trial were staged with PET. So uh, overall survival, in fact, was better in the uh, standard dose RT. Uh, this also uh, the five-year overall survival, progression-free survival, or in favor of the standard dose. Uh, the primary cause of this still was lung cancer. However, there were more treatment-related mortality uh, in the high-dose arm. Uh, what are the factors that affected overall survival? RT dose, higher RT dose uh, associated with worse survival location of tumor, those central or uh, in the lower loop, also the institutional uh, accrual volume, four versus more than uh, less than four patient, the grade of esophagitis, the higher than this was uh, correlated with poor overall survival, the larger PTV and the hard dose, both V50 and uh, V30. Uh, the trial also did secondary analysis, which compared the use of IMRT versus 3D. About uh, half of the patient received 3D conformal radiotherapy and the other IMRT. The IMRT group had larger PTVs, more stage 3B. Uh, overall, the outcome did not matter uh, whether or not the patient received IMRT or 3D conformal radiotherapy. Uh, however, IMRT was associated with less grade three uh, pneumonitis. Uh, the risk of pneumonitis was associated uh, with the larger volume. The V20, V5 did not show significant association and the advanced uh, stage. Uh, how about the treatment intensif intensification using consolidation immunotherapy. This was evaluated in the uh, Pacific trial. Basically, this is a phase three randomized control trial uh, that evaluated the role of uh, consolidation or maintenance Dorvalumab versus placebo for up to 12 months following uh, chemo RT. Uh, more than 200 sites participated in this trial in 26 countries across all six continents. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival, which was evaluated by a blinded independent central review. Uh, the other also co-primary endpoint was overall survival. There were different other secondary endpoints. Uh, this trial included patients with unresectable stage three disease who underwent chemo RT. Uh, the definition of chemo RT was the use of at least two cycles platinum-based doublet with chemotherapy to a definitive dose somewhere between 54 to 66 gray with the mean lung dose of less than 20 and V20 less than 35. Patient uh, should not progress following chemo RT and should still be in good status. And the initiation of Durvalumab initially was up to two weeks following treatment, but then uh, included patient up to six weeks following treatment. The trial excluded patients who received previous immunotherapy, those with active or previous autoimmune disease or history of immunodeficiency, those with unresolved toxic effect grade two or higher following chemo RT, and those patients who developed grade two or higher pneumonitis from previous chemo RT. Uh, the patient were uh, pre-stratified according to age, six, smoking history. Uh, patients were included in the period between uh, 2014 up to 2016, included more than uh, 200 patients. The median age was 62, as you would expect most of them male patient, mostly white, uh, about half and half uh, stage 3A, stage 3B, more, st more of uh, 3A. And for the most part, patients receive a dose between 54 to 63, and about 25 to 30 percent of patients received induction chemotherapy. And as you can see here, you would expect in a trial that included patients in 26 countries, there were different uh, chemotherapy agents that were used. Even few patients received single agent cisplatin and carboplatin, which is something we wouldn't do in, uh, in lung cancer. One more minute, Dr. Fahad. Okay. So basically, the trial showed significant improvement in overall survival uh, up to 47 months. 
compared to 29 months and with significant improvement of uh, progression-free survival. The incidence of brain myths was low. The benefit seems to be higher for those where started treatment in less than two weeks. Uh, and for the most part, there were no new safety signals. Uh, at least in grade three or higher uh, toxicity. Uh, this is just to compare the Pacific result with the trial that included uh, management of surgery with concurrent chemo RT. As you can see here, the median overall survival is uh, definitely better in the Pacific. So the conclusion adjuvant chemotherapy improved overall survival in stage three disease, adjuvant RT and completely resected in two disease does not improve outcome. Adjuvant estomertinib does improve progression-free. We don't know about overall survival. And outcome of concurrent chemo RT improve over time with better staging. And more recently, the addition of dorvalumab resulted in significant improvement in overall survival and progression-free survival. Thank you. That is wonderful, Fahad. Thank you very much. Uh, you're on time as well. So. Um, our next speaker is uh, well known to uh, most of you, Dr. Salem Shehri, consultant radiation oncologist at uh, National Guard Hospital. And he's gonna talk about guideline for stage three non-small cell lung cancer management, the Saudi Lung Cancer Association guideline. Uh, Dr. Uh, Salem, please. سالم اعتقد انه ميوت ما نسمعك السلام عليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته سو هالو ايفري وان دو سي دو سي ذا سلايدز كل So hello everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about the guidelines um, uh, generated by the uh, Saudi Lung um, Society. Um, uh, most of the, of the team involved in these guidelines um, are well known to uh, uh, our community and uh, most of them in the, in the audience. Uh, Dr. Amin and uh, Prof. Katan. Um, our aim to generate these guidelines, as it's been um, uh, discussed in the briefest talks, um, uh, the heterogeneity of uh, stage three uh, non-small cell lung cancer, as well as uh, there is a plenty of uh, trials and diversity of um, uh, protocols. Um, we aim by generating the, these guidelines is to have um, uh, a little of uh, standardization, and that would um, enhance uh, the quality of the patient's care, and it will um, serve as a roadmap for most of the um, institutions in um, our uh, uh, nation. So to start with, uh, as we mentioned previously, that the, there is a, a especially with the, with the, re, with the recent um, uh, update in the staging. As you see here, the, the, the diversity and the uh, multi-staged in each stage has been even categorized. Uh, we eventually um, concluded to go with uh, this um, nice diagram uh, to um, initiate the management of uh, any case of a stage three non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, 
in my personal opinion, the most important thing is to have a, a, a multidisciplinary team equipped with expertise from all uh, specialties. Uh, not only um, an oncologist, uh, additional oncologist, medical oncologist, even if you go in deep with the management of the state uh, of lung cancer, you need um, um, thoracic surgeons, you need um, interventionists, uh, radiologists, um, an expertise who even um, how to manipulate and uh, uh, dig with them uh, uh, in the bronchial ultrasounds, um, um, a pathologist who can even uh, go with the identification of the all markers of the, as you know, in all uh, non-small cell lung cancer. So uh, as you see in, the, in this diagram, there are a, a category of cases, which is uh, um, very easy going, non, uh, non restrictable stage three non-small cell lung cancer. You can go with uh, uh, as a, a straightforward with the concurrent chemotherapy. Uh, as um, the evidence has been evolved, there is a, uh, a restrictable non-small cell lung cancer. Is it really a restrictable uh, decided by the, uh, the thoracic surgeon or it is a potentially resectable. And then here we're, where we go in the, a little bit of a gray zone, uh, which really uh, mandate the uh, necessity of a multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, we will go with this diagram and uh, piece by piece in the following slides. As we know in the stage 3A, T4 and 0 and 0, uh, usually the standard of care is surgery. But sometimes if you, if you face a case of that the patient is not fit for surgery or if the patient is refusing surgery, then uh, we uh, recommended in these guidelines to use a selective patient for uh, SABER that, uh, that you can consider for these kind of patients. Um, there are ongoing um, um, evidence um, level of two trials that supporting the use of SPRT uh, as you see here in this slide, this is uh, one example of these like cases when you have a T4 and 0. Uh, these kind of patients, you can provide them uh, an option of uh, treatment instead of um, decline of any uh, radical um, option. Uh, these kind of patients can reach a, a local control of uh, 70%. Um, so we concluded that, the, that those kind of patients uh, the best standard of care is to proceed with surgery. If not, then you can offer the patient of um, uh, an option of uh, stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy. Uh, for the stage 3A, uh, T3, N1, T4, N1, M0, if the, it's unresectable, then as we all know, it's concurrent chemotherapy. If a bulky tumor, then you, and it, the plan is not consistent with the uh, with the constraint, um, we usually adhere with uh, lung, um, then we can offer uh, an induction course of chemotherapy, then to uh, proceed with the radical course of chemo RT. If the patient is not fit for uh, um, chemotherapy, then you can go with the radical option of uh, definitive radiotherapy alone. In that case, we would um, not recommend conventional uh, type of uh, radiotherapy, then we would highly recommend proceeding with um, altered fractionation, hypofractionation, for example, at the um, MD Anderson protocol. Um, so we um, concluded that concurrent chemotherapy uh, followed by the uh, for one year, uh, surgical resection can be considered in um, highly selected cases. Uh, for potentially resectable stage uh, N2 disease, um, again, uh, we would um, emphasize on the importance of multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, the standard of care, as we you know, is a definitive chemotherapy. If uh, our colleagues, um, uh, thoracic surgeon, um, recommend surgery or this kind or this category of patient is uh, potentially acceptable, then we um, luckily um, approach uh, and try to define these kind of patients. Uh, first of all, we, uh, we would not recommend the monectomy. Uh, we would prefer lobectomy. Uh, um, N2 disease, um, it's highly recommended to be in single station, not multiple level station. Uh, Non-bulky um, N2 disease, uh, the precise definition of non-bulky disease still uh, in a borderline. 
we would recommend it to be within a, uh, less than 2.5 centimeter and then to be discussed in a multidisciplinary team uh, to decide on uh, proceeding with um, uh, this protocol, with, which is trimodality treatment. Um, and we would highly recommend, and as um, it's mentioned by our co colleagues previously, uh, what is the appropriate window between chemo uh, between uh, definitive um, uh, chemo therapy, and then to go to surgery? Is it two weeks to four weeks? What is the best dose? Um, it's been mentioned in a discussion by Dr. Amin and um, Prof. Khan that we and uh, we would. Um, they come in to go with the radical dose of 60. Even in Alpine trial, they, uh, the protocol was a 45 gray. Uh, the reason for this is not because of logistic or we, you cannot squeeze the patient. Even if you plan the surgery very well, um, we found in uh, proceed, proceeding with 60 gray is more of, um, uh, of sense and, and controlling the disease. Uh, 45 gray um, and back in, in practical uh, way we uh, we found the, most of the cases they can progress uh, even if you stick with the with the window of proceeding with surgery so we eventually we agreed with the with a period of four weeks that the patient should be planned uh, this four weeks has been measured from the last day of receiving radiotherapy within four weeks the patient should be on the table of surgery um, um, our experience that uh, 60 gray uh, it doesn't make a big difference with our colleagues in, uh, in thoracic surgery. Um, it makes a difference if the patient uh, period prolonged more than um, a four weeks, then the thoracic surgeon uh, will find a difficulty in proceeding with surgery. And pneumonectomy, as we, um, as I previously mentioned, is not encouraged encouraged at all, especially with the right side. Uh, what about if the thoracic surgeon then an open uh, the surgical theater and found an incidental into a disease. Uh, we agreed um, as a committee that if N2 disease is covered during surgery, the surgeon is um, um, allowed to abort the surgery if pneumonectomy is required, uh, and then to proceed with the, with the definitive treatment. Uh, if um, N2 disease as an incidental, then we would recommend adjuvant chemo uh, chemotherapy alone. Um, adjuvant radiotherapy is still uh, not based, as, as we know, in, um, in the briefest trial sport, the uh, N2 disease, even if I'm um, a fan of delivering radiotherapy to N2 disease, but it's need to be selected to uh, a very uh, precise category of those, uh, of those patients. So we agreed in, uh, in these guidelines to keep uh, the recommendation of radiotherapy in N2 disease um, based on the discretion of the radiation oncologist. If unresectable stage three, uh, N3 disease, um, N3 disease, we uh, agreed to proceed with as a management of stage three. Yeah, as we know, three B disease, uh, N3 disease uh, hasn't been included in the, the most of trials, but sometimes when you have N3 disease that can be contained in, in a radiotherapy uh, volume, which defined very well, like suspecting the constraints of you know, organic risk, then these kind of patients, they, we um, recommend that they proceed with the radical course of chemo radiotherapy especially if the radiotherapy field is, uh, as we mentioned, safely uh, defined and the patient had a good performance status. Uh, radiotherapy regimens for uh, adjuvant um, uh, delivery, um, uh, these the radiation um, regimens we agreed on, um, we agreed on to stick with the conventional standard 60 to 66 gray. If the pre-op, as we mentioned in stage three, uh, 45 and 25 is still an option, and we we put the 60 uh, gray and 30 to be as an option. Uh, in the adjuvant settings, uh, we agreed on the 54 gray. And um, um, some, um, um, in most of the literature, unfortunately, it's as retrospective uh, literatures. We highly recommend to proceed with the 1.8, not to proceed with the 2 gray. 
uh, even if we don't have a good uh, solid evidence on this. Um, the maximum dose is uh, 54 gray. Uh, if you have a microscopic and extra capsule extension, then you go with 54 to 60. If R2 um, and or with a macroscopic nodal extension, then 60 gray and 30 fractions. As we know, as a guidelines, we should implement, uh, mention this uh, BCI in small cell lung cancer um, is not um, recommended. Uh, thank you so much. That is wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Salim. It was an excellent presentation and summary. Actually, uh, maybe all the audience now noticed that uh, non-small cell lung cancer, especially stage three, is a heterogeneous group. And a lot of studies, somebody recommending initial chemotherapy, somebody no concurrent chemo radiation therapy, somebody no surgery first, because it is sometimes the primary big, sometimes the, the patient not fit for surgery. Uh, this makes us as a radiation oncologist to be more flexible with our colleagues in medical oncology and uh, uh, thoracic surgery. So any patient need to be treated for lung cancer, it should be discussed in the lung cancer tumor board. Otherwise the treatment will be from one side and the patient will not benefit from the other modalities. Uh, thank you very much. So if anybody uh, have any question from the audience, we can go through it, uh, me and Amin. And uh, really we have an excellent uh, attendance now, 52 uh, mixture between highly expert surgeons and radiation oncologists. And maybe there is some medical oncologists which I didn't recognize. So if anybody have any question or discussion about what uh, mentioned in this uh, three pre excellent presentations, we still have time for discussion. Uh, yeah. This is so what I, I would have uh, discussed it with Dr. Amin. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Amin, uh, what is your, um, uh, do you agree with uh, using the 60 gray and 30 instead of 40, uh, 45 gray in, in new adjuvant settings? Oh, I mean, it's in a stage 3A uh, uh, nurse muscle lung cancer. If, if there is plan for trimodality, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the same issue that uh, you, thank you very much for this question, Sarah. Same issue that discussed uh, uh, previously uh, between Adnan and Prof. Khan. Actually, uh, when I came to King Faisal, uh, I, I inherited this from Adnan. Uh, the practice, but only limited center was doing this, uh, giving 63, uh, 60 grade 30 fraction. Then a few weeks later, the, uh, the surgery would operate. Uh, Prof. Khan was, uh, his team was very, very, very comfortable in doing that. Uh, so I did it. And with time, it's the practice starts to be more and more adapted in most of the North American center because yeah. of the concern, because of the concern that you might not able to operate after a few weeks and you're giving the patient microscopic dose. So yes, I, I give 60 all the time. And thank you very much to our surgeon who always uh, are very comfortable in operating with those patients. And also thanks to Adran, I inherited this from Dr. Hibshi. But then I have a few questions to the, to the audience uh, uh, we want to learn from their practice. So if you are comfortable in giving new adjuvant uh, uh, concurrent chemoradiotherapy for patients with stage 3A by virtue of having into disease, then are you going to do PET-CT afterward, uh, 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 part of you know, to assess response and to make sure that there is no disease progression, but also if the patient having persistent PET positive or FDG Abbott PET positive into disease, then some center or most of the center, they will not operate because those patients has dismal prognosis. This is my first question. My second question is to Prof. Qattan, just uh, I want him to uh, uh, elaborate on one of the surgical uh, point that he mentioned. So. Uh, the reason why we are keeping the window only four weeks, uh, uh, less than four weeks, like three to four weeks, uh, is because of the concern about having frozen mediastinum, or do you have any other concern? Uh, so let's address to, to maybe should, we should start with the, with the surgical question to Prof. Kaplan since he's with us. Dr. Qatan, are you with us? I think uh, maybe he's not. Uh, uh, he will catch with us. Let's see. Uh, 
There is a very interesting, a very interesting question by Dr. Al Asaf. Ah, but but Adnan, Allah is talking. Can I ask two questions? Maybe Prof. Kaptan is not here. The second question is open. Prof. Kaptan is here, so you can say the first question. Okay, yeah, travel. Maybe you can comment on two questions on, on persistent FDG avid into disease after Kimurad and also about the uh, narrow window between Kimurad and surgery. We know that if we wait a long time, it's better response, better down staging. Uh, colorectal, we wait for two months, three months to allow maximum benefit of Kimurad or RAD. But in surgery, is, I think there is concern about having frozen with the them, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it for you, Prof. Yeah, I think the, the concept of window in uh, lung cancer after concurrent chemo radiotherapy, the, the ideal is before four weeks. Uh, of course, this is judged by how the patient responded to the last dose of concurrent chemo radiotherapy because we know that optimized uh, status is three weeks after the chemo. So I usually like to take that window, both three weeks and before four weeks. Uh, as the window to operate. Of course, you know, if a patient is late for a week or two, it doesn't mean I uh, would label him as non-surgical. Uh, the second uh, item, I think you see the problem with stage three and most of the studies done on stage three uh, disease do not stratify the cases as such. So t to, if you have T3N1, or even T4 that may be with extensive surgery uh, respond. And you have the N2 disease, which is a completely different uh, entity. And as surgeon, I consider N2 disease as a systemic involvement already. And that uh, concurrent chemo radiotherapy is a must. And even with concurrent chemo, uh, will we'll give a better, uh, a better uh, result, definitely. So we, we really loved Adura study because it, it, it really uh, brought uh, the sense of uh, the effect of uh, circulating malignant cells in the presence of N2 disease and possible with large tumors that are five to seven T3 or even more than seven as T4. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, the key to me or the, the home, take home message is that <clears throat> if you have a good cancer center where you have a good surgeon and a good oncologist and good radiation oncologist, and you discuss this in a tumor board, putting all aspects of the uh, case, including the performance status and the type of surgery that he required and the uh, uh, your own you know, results, then definitely I'm a strong believer of uh, systemic treatment for stage three. I'm a strong believer of radiotherapy, uh, effectiveness uh, from new adjuvant. And uh, as a concurrent chemo radio with intention to cure, uh, with concurrent chemo radiotherapy for downstaging and for post operative. Uh, radiation or even concurrent uh, chemo radiotherapy, uh, especially if there's a target therapy involved, uh, if there is uh, evidence of pathological N2 but was not there as the clinical N2 before. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very there's much. There's another question for Amin about the PET scan. Can I get a clear answer from Dr. Qattan? I'm sorry, Dr. Adnan. So, N2 disease post-chemotherapy is not a surgical candidate. A persistence into disease is not a surgical candidate. It's a chemo radiotherapy treatment. Am I right? Yeah, I agree. But the, the, the dilemma usually is what, how you define persistent into. Are you talking radiological or confirmation of, and this is the type. How many times you wanna uh, stage the mediastinum uh, pathologically, I mean taking a biopsy. B when we used to do the mediastinoscopy, this was an, a problem. But now with the EBUS, it is helped us to re-biopsy the mediastinum without 
uh, with reducing the false negative and false positive results. So I, that's why I like the EBUS as a pre-op, a pre uh, for st initial staging to confirm into disease. And after concurrent chemoradiotherapy, and then if you see that there is a reduction, say in the uptake and reduction in size, but not uh, in the level you feel comfortable, you restage him again. You have to give the patient the maximum chance. If the restaging is negative, I'll go ahead with surgery. Are but if I am not going to do... Now, are we talking about bulky in two disease or a single in two disease? Yeah, I mean, you see, I was part of the workshop that was done for the last staging. And uh, me and my team were in the lymph node group. We divided ourselves. It took us a lot of time to, give, to come up with the International Association of Study Lung Cancer staging that adopted later on by the, uh, the American Society. And when we were working, we looked into not just single station versus multiple station, and we looked into bulky disease versus non-bulky disease, and we looked actually into which station. And I tell you what we found uh, was interesting, but we could not translate this into the staging system. So station five and six, subaortic and paraortic lymph nodes with left upper lobe tumor, they have a prognosis as good as N1 disease. Uh, but, you know, we, we could not uh, put that in the staging. Uh, uh, bulky versus non-bulky disease would very much uh, uh, not really made a difference, but what made a difference, how they responded to preoperative chemotherapy. Uh, Subcarinal group of lymph nodes involvement had the worst prognosis, but uh, it really did not make a difference because it did, the patients with upper lobes did better than those with the lower lobes. Other lymph node station like station nine along the inferior pulmonary ligament or the paraosophageal lymph nodes uh, really was controversial from different places. So I tell you better, uh, if you want an evidence answer, science answer, I, we will not tell you anything. What I will tell you is me as a surgeon, subaortic, paraortic lymph node involvement, left upper lobe, I am more relaxed to operate in the presence of N2 disease uh, and more relaxed to operate after uh, concurrent chemoradiotherapy even with the minor reduction in the size. Uh, bulky uh, subcarinal nodes, I take it with a lot of precaution and I try to find a way not to operate on those uh, by saying, uh, okay, there is a reduction, but please repeat the biopsy. So that if it is positive, I say no. But definitely do not operate on N2 positive disease, which is pathological and clinical at the same time. Now, uh, if there is a good response to the lymph node and the patient requires lobectomy, give him the benefit of that. Because if with lobectomy, he can still, you're still going to do lymphadenectomy. And if there is pathological into, despite the treatment, he can continue on chemo radiotherapy. Uh, now with the target therapy, really you have to be more aggressive because we know that if you put them on, and that's what Adura study also showed us, that even after resection, and that uh, you thought you downstaged him, he's not into anymore, but then you did the surgery and you took all the station two lymph node and you have one out of three came positive and he is EGFR positive, give him uh, target therapy, third generation, and he will do well. So that's our philosophy as surgeon when we deal with this. But I agree on this single statement, persistent N2 disease is not a surgical uh, case. Excellent. Good. Leo. So uh, I have a lot of questions from the uh, audience. Uh, one of them, I don't know. He, he knew the answer, but he wanted to trick us. I think I saw a question for Dr. Saif al one of the... Uh, thoracic radiation oncologist. He said, what about old people? Do you still recommend his... Uh, uh, not, not safe, not safe to talk about. I think, for example, Jibab. 
Oh, the one who said the old people do think yeah. for to so save a jibab. Okay, so uh, both of them sword, save a jibab and save a sapphire. <laughs> <laughs> so, Salim Masjidhi, can you please uh, comment on this? The the question is for elderly patient. Do you stick to sixty to sixty six gray, or do or to do more hypofractionation regime such as forty five and and fifteen? Well, uh, yeah, to sell. Um, it's the it's the age and the performance status. In this kind of patient, uh, I personally prefer and I recommend the hypofractionation protocol. We do find, um, honestly, uh, a good response using the MD Anderson protocol, 52.5 and 15 fractions. And we have um, our experience on this is uh, any, uh, remarkable. Do you, do you include the lymph nodes also with this dot? A. Mediastinal lymph nodes. Yeah, um, we do. Yeah. Oh, I, I guess this is for patients who who not in a, who not. Yeah, thank you. Enough for... to get chemotherapy, right? To save. Yeah, this is a uh, uh, traditional. Yeah. So, yeah, but, uh, Doctor Safe, yes, I do agree. And sometimes it, uh, the, I, I'm happy to have your opinion as well. So these kind of patients, when you go with even hypofractionation hybr protocol. Uh, and sometimes if I found some constraints, difficulties, I go down with those with uh, up to 15, 15. And do, uh, we do have any, even the team is uh, happy with the outcome, having a good local control on this, on this population using this uh, protocol. I see. Uh, we, I had several patients, um, again, elderly, uh, borderline performance status, you know, the kind of patient where you're worried to give them concurrent chemo radiation and then they would end up in the emergency room or get some kind of cardiotoxicity or uh, some other kind of adverse event. And so what I've been doing is more like a sequential approach uh, where they can do uh, either systemic therapy first or uh, hypofraction regimen first, depending on how bulky and how big the disease is, and then go with the other treatment. Um, so that's kind of like what I've been doing. I, the hypofractionate regimen I've been using was 45 and 15. I haven't looked at the MD Anderson one. Maybe I should, and I'll reach out to you for that uh, study or, or publication. Now, some, some of the some of patients even, uh, uh, I pushed the limit to, with concurrent uh, using this protocol, 15, 15. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. We use uh, be, um, with the help of, of our um, uh, colleagues in medical oncology, uh, we use this, uh, some, you know, we adjust the chemo um, dose and we go with the small weekly dose and we hit with 15, 15. Uh, also, there is a question by Hussam Al-Assaf. I think he changed his hat to medical oncologist. He said, do you think NGS, uh, ALK, AGFR will change the staging, especially now stage four lung ALK positive outcome? Better than stage three lung cancer. I don't know what he means, but uh, doctor, I think uh, uh, Ruiz will answer this question. Dr. Fader Ruiz, Dr. Hassan al uh, to everyone. Yes, I think they should have their own uh, staging system. Median survivor of EGFR stage four uh, lung cancer is over uh, 30 months, and the ALK positive is almost double that number. Uh, however, also median survival, as you just see in the uh, Pacific trial, was uh, over the 40 months. But uh, yeah, I believe uh, they should be included in, uh, you know, or the staging system should be modified. For example, in, in head and neck, the staging system also was modified based on uh, HPV status. And I believe the effect of these uh, mutation even... Uh, uh, on the outcome is much more important than, for example, HPV and head and neck. So it, it makes sense. Interesting. Good, very good point. Uh, uh, but, but still, it's tricky because they have long media survival, but our medical oncologists always will never say, I can cure you. Uh, apart from, you know, if they have oligometastasis, I'm going to talk about generally speaking, they will never say we have a curative disease. While in stage three, uh, although uh, we can cure small subset of patients up to maybe 15 to 25 percent, like Dr. Rahim Omari uh, mentioned, but you can still uh, cure some patients. We have long term cure. So it's tricky. The median, the median survival for stage three is not that long in all trials before Pacific. It's, it's ranging between 20 to 24. And most of the 
stage four EGFR mutant or, or alkaline arrangement patient, they have more than 36 months median survival. But you know, eventually they have they will progress in systemic therapy and and hope uh, unfortunately die. So it's tricky. Uh, Adran, you see, there is a question by Dr. Ibrahim Al Umari. Okay. Ibrahim, I'm sorry. All of Ibrahim, like safe. Like safe. So what yeah. radiation uh, therapy for uh, if you use concurrent chemo? Do you stick to 60 like the evidence, or do you give slightly higher than 60? For stage, I assume the question is for stage three, since the whole meeting is about locally local advanced asthma and cancer. So, who will take this question? Uh, maybe uh, who? Ibrahim Al Umar Mahna. Ibrahim. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of, you know, earlier there was a lot of discussion about lung correction and whether you use 60 or 66 if you are uh, not lung correcting. And there was a lot of uh, debate about this. I mean, if you take the evidence uh, based on the 617 uh, trial, I would stick to 60 gray. Uh, yes, I would love to go higher, but that is a case by case. In general, the dose that we stick with uh, nowadays is 60 gray. Uh, if you want to escalate the dose, then you have to be very careful about uh, you know, uh, limiting your uh, organ at risk doses to the minimal uh, dose possible. So short answer, 60 gray is my uh, dose. And if I want to escalate, I will have to uh, see the patient, the performance status and the disease location as well. Wonderful answer, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, I just, interestingly, Dr. Fadir Weiss and myself discussed this maybe a few months ago, if you remember. So I agree with Ibrahim. Uh, for, for evidence-based, you need to stick to 60 as, as bare the RTUG0167, but more, which is, which is the correct answer, but then most people believe that there is a dose response. We know from stage one and stage two, when you can hit the target away from this time, you can escalate the dose up to what, uh, whatever, what's uh, something equivalent, uh, be it equivalent to 180, 120, uh, and you have better local control. But then you can't do this in modestinum. We know that 74 gray was very toxic and lots of uh, acute death or cardiac event that's happened. So the balance that most experts believe that, yeah, there is those response. So for uh, some center like Stanford, they give 66 and 30. So slightly hyperfractionated 66. And PMH, they use 66 and 33 because they believe there is those response. Uh, but I agree to Dr. Rahim Emery totally. Uh, uh, evidence is evidence, and they, they stick to 60. Assalamu alaikum. Back to Omar Iskandarani. Uh, I usually uh, I go for 66. يعني غالبا غالبا بعطي up to 66. نادرا ما بعطي 60. والحمد لله الحمد لله ما بتواجهنا كثير يعني those limiting. فا I usually go to up to 66. صراحة. I believe in this. لكن لو ما قدر طبعا بنزل ل 60 How much V20 do you usually get V20 V10 V5 with this with 66 والله يوجولي ال V20 غالبا بتكون 16 18 طبعا اليوجول البرفورمنس ستيتس حقت البيشنت يفرق ال pulmonary function test لكن غالبا صراحه كل الدوز ليمتنج بتعدي غالبا ما بنشوف كثير لانج في جده لكن لما بن يعني بنشوف لنج صراحه بحاول اطلع ل 66 غالبا يعطيك العافيه والله باك تو عدنان اي ثينك وي هاف تو مينت مور رايت جست ميبي ذا فيزيست ويل هيلب يو اباوت ذا دوز اي بيليف ات كينج فيسر سبيشال هوست ذات ذي ار يوزينج مونتي كارلو سيستم تو ميجر ذا دوز تو ذي ستراكشرز هير ات جونز هوبكنز وي ار نوت يوزينج ذا مونتي كارلو سو ذا مونتي كارلو مور اكوريت Measurement of the dose. So, if you want to give 60, you will give 60. The old uh, system where they don't, uh, they are not uh, account for the uh, tissue factor. So, that's why the 60 gray in Dillman trial and in the R2G trial was higher. And now we are correcting for that. So, we need to increase the dose. But uh, I don't know, but Monte Carlo, they give really 60 gray. Uh, so, it will not, it will account the uh, the air inside the lung and the tissue inside the lung and will give you really 60 gray. So maybe this will not change a lot between the centers, but I think 
if we give 60 gray is good. If you can give more, it's better. Really, I, what I learned from Salim today and uh, Jibab uh, that uh, concurrent chemo radiation therapy can be given in hypofractionation uh, in all people, which is really uh, interesting information to me. I, I, I don't use it usually, but uh, I will start using it. Dr. Adnan, it's a nice comment from you talking about the uh, difference in, in uh, system and using uh, Monte Carlo is different than when you, we, uh, I personally found the difference between 6 and 66. And you, we used to use um, um, the Eclipse and so, uh, software, uh, my training, and we used to use 66, but I found it's very different when you use Monte Carlo. I agree with you totally. So I, uh, then I, I, uh, I dropped the 66 and I went with 60 and 30 gray. Excellent. Actually, the OSAP is just one of the very important things. I, if the, there is a lot of multi, or multiple lymph nodes in the uh, media standards, which in N2, I do not recommend 66 because I faced one patient with dysphagia at the end. She was almost cured from her lung cancer, but she came with difficulty in swallowing and uh, two vestigial dilatation, one end up with perforation and another toxicity. Really, she was not, she was mad at me because I created the osophageal uh, uh, stenosis. So that's why uh, I, uh, 60 gray, it is, uh, I, I never had any problem with the 60 gray, especially in the esophagus. That's why I, uh, I recommend 60 in most of my patients. I think now we uh, uh, will go to the uh, next uh, session. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all the participants in this session. Thank you, Dr. Amin al umair Ibrahim al umairi Fahad al ruwais Salim al-Shahri, and, and a special, really special thank for Professor Gattan for the, uh, the music he, he gave us. Really, I, I'm listening to uh, Abdel Basit Abdel Samad, Baba Gur Symphony, Bani Zahad al So the next session will be the clinical session and with the moderator Ibrahim Al Umari. Okay. And <laughs> Thank you, Adnan and Amin, for moderating the first session. Uh, this session will be clinical scenario. Uh, I'll be moderating this with my colleague, Dr. Hani Mu'mina. Dr. Hani is a radiation oncologist at King Faisal Specialty Hospital and Research Center in Jeddah. Uh, Dr. Hani. Hey, Ibrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Uh, Saif al Thakafi. Uh, he's well known radiation oncologist uh, working in uh, King Abdelaziz Medical City, Riyadh. Uh, he will present advanced lung cancer cases, treatment uh, decision, and technical details. Uh, please, Dr. Saif, uh, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Majid. Uh, I'm Dean Dr. Rahim al Atim for the nice invitation. Thank you, Dr. Hani, uh, for the nice introductions. Uh, as we are uh, approaching Ramadan, Nadu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you will have no way to come to Ramadan, which I'm not inshallah, in al Makbulin. I'm trying to share the screen. I'm not sure if it's working. Nothing yet. Nothing yet? No. Nope. Maybe the last one, uh, Dr. Salem, share and then please share small. Disconnect, okay? I think it uh, just security things. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah safe, <laughs> and, uh, I just need you. Uh... Okay. Uh, Zoom will not able to. So you should be able now. Uh, I need to quit and reopen just a second. Sure.
So until Dr. Safe is back now, I mean, with all this information uh, we have from the molecular uh, testing, how would that change the management for stage three non-small cell lung cancer? I mean, now the pathologists do a panel of all these uh, molecular testing uh, upfront when they have a, a pathology. So we'll uh, get back when Dr. Safe finished. Okay, so if now we can see the presentation. Okay, say we can see, you can start. We can't hear you. أكله فور سيكوريتي ريزم عاد صار يتكلم. It's a safe room. Say whatever you want, safe. هاي خليه زي شاب لي شاب لي بس بالصوت. ألو. أيوة. نسمعك. أيوة. أوكي. في واحد كان في عنده مشكلة يعني أنا قلت لكم سيكوريتي is important. <laughs> okay, the first case will be like uh, this is will be discussion, inshallah, to uh, very beneficial and enjoyable. So, this is a 70 years old presented uh, with chance of breath and cough, uh, 50 years uh, back history of smoking, nothing significant in the past medical history. Performance is good. We'll go through the imaging. So, this is the I mean, CT of the lung, lung window. And here is the lesions. So there is no other lesions. Okay. So then we'll go to the... mediastinal window. So in the mediastinal window, we see uh, a big Station five lymph nodes. You can see it here. So this is the lymph nodes. There is no other lymph node on the CT. Here is uh, the pit. So the pit again showed the very active station five and also the primary in the left upper limb. So staging uh, wise was uh, negative for any disease outside. Biopsy, it came on uh, as adenocarcinoma of the lung. So the final stage is T1C in two and zero. So I listed some options there, but uh, I'm sure there is other options uh, being discussed uh, through this meeting. And I'm opening now, uh, uh, anyone to uh, share anything about like what he think the, the best treatment option for this case. So audience, uh, Dr. Said presented the case and now he put the treatment options. So based on the stage and the uh, imaging. Any volunteer, any takers? So we should just choose or what? Uh, choose the best for you. And you uh, can discuss it with the group. I, I believe after discussion with Dr. Qatan, the, the best option is probably new adjuvant systemic uh, therapy followed by the surgery. Today I had a patient who had the same thing and we did the lymphadenectomy actually, plus an upper lobectomy, the same case. Safe and I, I missed something. Is, is, was there a sampling from the lymph node like ebus or anything was done no the the team thought it is uh, like big node uh, and also pit positive so they didn't go for uh, i mean uh, sampling of this node uh, it's been considered to be positive uh, is is it like at this stage surgical like for a uh, question for the surgeon like this big lymph node can be removed 
because the primary is is a small like uh, uh, and the patient is good performance again you need to prove that this is a positive lymph node by apis and then new adjuvant followed by for better cure new adjuvant followed by uh, an upper lobectomy as well as lymphadenectomy that's my belief you will not restage after the new adjuvant chemotherapy dr bamusa as the Tukatpa mentioned that he will of course of course we will do restaging uh, by pet um, if he had epis yeah, we could do medicinoscopy, but even if it is positive with the, such a lesion that can be taken, I mean, it's the lymph node can be easily taken out. Okay. Okay. So uh, this case has been presented in our uh, tumor board and the decision was to go with uh, chemo radiations as new adjuvant, but as Dr. Salim mentioned, we go with the definitive way of treatment with uh, 60 gray. Uh, so here I just, uh, I'm showing the GTV and the CTV for the, both the lymph node and uh, for the primary. Uh, for the radiation oncologist, I mean here, uh, I mean, there is variation about, I mean, the CTV uh, or from GTP to CTP, either like five or seven. Uh, for the lymph nodes, some include like the whole stations or just uh, a margin around the lymph nodes. Uh, any comment about that uh, from the rest of the group? From an old postpartum, um, uh, post-mortem studies, uh, the uh, CTV, the cancer cells were found within seven millimeters from the uh, primary disease. And I think that is within the volume. So five to seven millimeter from your GTV to CTV, I would say it is appropriate for a CTV. Thank you. I would still do uh, a 40 CT scan and uh an IGTV uh, for this case. So, uh, uh, usually we're using te technology like 4D CT, well, yeah. Uh, if, we, if we don't use 4D CT, then I will agree with the firm. Uh, if, if we use the 4D CT, then I will, I will be tight a little bit with my margins. Do you have a 4D CT uh, safe? Yes, uh, it's been done actually, and there wasn't like a big movement. So that's why you didn't see it uh, like the ITV. So it was very minimal movement in both the lymph node and the primary. And we use uh, the average, I mean, uh, CT to contour on. But it's and been done for the 4D yeah. CT. And for the lymph node, do you just uh, contour the lymph node or do you contour the... Uh, area around as well, because here I see in your CTV, on the uh, bottom left, your CTV is covering the whole, uh, you know, uh, area around the uh, node. It's kind of uh, like a philosophical thing is, when you add this five millimeter, it will be the whole, just the, in the blood vessel. So we will end up with, without any space you're covering. Uh, so that's like it just trying to cover five millimeters, uh, not like automatic uh, created five millimeters. Uh, that's why you see it is bigger, yeah. but it wasn't intended to cover the whole station. It was intended to cover with the five millimeters, uh, but because of the location of the lymph node, when you add this five millimeters, it's, it's just the blood vessels. So you will end up with uh, just the GTV with around maybe one millimeters. Okay. Any more comments? Any questions? Do you routinely add the CTV on your GTV? For the locally advanced, yes, we do. Uh, I'm not sure I, if any practice, yes. Yeah, I don't. I just go C, uh, GTV to PTV encountering the uh, CTV within the PTV itself.
I don't. I do just GTV and uh, a margin to account for ITV and then a smaller margin for a PTV for setup error. Okay. Any other practices? Or a quick question for the group. Uh, when, if you're going to do a 4D CT, do you tend to do an average in a MIP or do you tend to contour on all 10 phases? Uh, usually, Dr. Saif, uh, it depends. Sometimes if the legion close the diaphragm or close and, and, and we assess, usually when we go with 4D CT, we assess the movement of the tumor. So, so if we, if we, if the uh, phys treating physician believe that, that the tumor is highly movable, especially on my person or any experience, if it's on the diaphragm and uh, or the sh at the, uh, abutting the chest wall, yes, we go with contouring uh, on 10 faces on the map. If it's not, then we, we, we just go with the, with the map alone. We don't have a 4C, uh, 4D CT in our center. So what I do is I do a poor man 4D. So uh, expiration, inhalation, expiration, and then I fuse them and I use them as uh, my uh, target. Dr. Wessi, you don't, you don't usually go with CTV five millimeter? No, I don't. I don't use CTV for uh, look for chemo RT with lung cancer. Uh, Only GTV have, and ITV and smaller margin for PTV. And you have uh, for the uh, using for the CT. Yes, but uh, we do use for the CT. Okay. Uh, Is that the practice? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Dr. Uh, I was just asking, was that the practice with the Pacific trial? I mean, uh, mostly my recommendation here is based on the Pacific trial. Did they do a, a CTV? I, I just do not recall in their actual manuscript if they tended to do that or not. There's not much information about, uh, I mean, the technical details of uh, radiation. I just mentioned uh, these are the dose constraints that they uh, look for. In fact, randomization happened and screening patient after uh, chemo RT, but in the RTOG, for example, 0617, they did add CTV uh, somewhere between 0.5 up to one centimeter. Yeah, I, I guess uh, just one more question. Uh, one, more, one more comment, then I'll go to my question. Yeah, most of the, uh, or almost all of the NRG trial, they use mar CTV margin between five to 10 millimeter. Uh, my practice is to add CTV margin. Reason because in the old days, uh, you can go from GTV to PTV by the time they used to give PTV, like one and a half centimeter in the upper lobe and two centimeter in the lower lobe. But now we're using 4D CT, then you we're using daily combium CT, and our PTV is, is so tight. Um, but but I guess my question maybe to Dr. Say, Dr. Say, can we go back to the previous slide? Are you doing if this patient had mediastinal lymph node? I, this CT simulation without contrast, I, I believe? Yeah, we don't do CT uh, with contrast. Uh, and any particular reason for that? Uh, it just, I mean, uh, the, I mean, most of those patients sometimes having like other, uh, like chronic diseases problem with the kidneys. And we uh, kind of comfortable, I mean, uh, just contouring on the mediastinal without uh, IV contrast. And it's been actually my practicing in Orawa as well, yeah. It, uh, they, they are afraid of, I mean, uh, rare toxicity of the contrast and also logistic that a physician should attend the CT uh, if there is a contrast. So our practice was we are rarely use uh, contrast in the lung cancer. Yes. What about fusion with PET CT scan, uh, say? Uh, yes, we we do. For uh, some cases, we do. Yes, and actually, we have like uh, uh, a bit CT. Uh, it is in the bed department, but it is equipped uh, with the lasers and everything to be uh, easy to fuse. So we use it in some cases. Yeah, I, I do the same. Say I don't use uh, IV contrast for all my cases, all sites, and since I came, and I'm being very uh, happy and uh, it's a learning curve. And uh, I never had any problem where I wished 
I uh, use the contrast. I am with you, um, uh, uh, Ibrahim. I didn't use contrast since I came, 2006, till today. Me as well, Dr. Adnan. <laughs> Great mind, thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I believe all the surgeons are doing CT with contrast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, so this is the BTV, uh, and the planning we did plan this patient with uh, FEMAT, uh, and he received six degree and thirty fractions. Here, just uh, I mean, a couple of images about the the planning. It was very good plan. This is the, the, the I mean, uh, statistic like the pH uh, numbers. So uh, the coverage was very good. So we have uh, like 100% of the dose receive uh, like our, I mean, around 94 percentage of the volume receive 100% of the dose. 100 uh, of the volume received 95% of the dose. Uh, heart, sphagus, everything was good. Uh, so here you see just the left lung, the right lung uh, didn't receive much of, of radiations. So the V20 here just to the left lung, uh, and this is uh, considering the whole lung without, with, with the volume, I mean, with the disease there, it is around 36. I know some people, uh, I mean, uh, when they look at the same uh, lung with the disease, they uh, just distract the the PTV or GTV from the lung and then they assess uh, the lung. Uh, any comment about this? Like, uh, are people happy with the numbers? Uh, would people push more to get lower number on the, on the left lung? I tend to do the lung minus uh, GTV. You know, me and Dr. Uh, Saif al Thakfi not only share a name, but we share a history too. And I always tell him to be careful what he does because whatever he does might be crossed over to me as well. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I, I do the same. I, uh, I do uh, line minus PTV and then I uh, calculate based on that. Um, the numbers looks good. So yeah, uh, nothing from my side. Anyone else has any uh, comment or concern? I think this is, uh, came from Mary Graham. Uh, from St. Louis Hospital, if I'm not mistaken. The V20, based on uh, the measurement of V20 is uh, PT, uh, lung, uh, V20 uh, minus PTV. It should be, you should exclude the PTV from the calculation of the dose of the lung. That's why we accept up to 35% as we saw in one of the presentation. Yes. So uh, unfortunately, I, I forget to put it, but uh, I mean, what you see here is the, the lung, the complete lung with the disease, uh, not minus the BTV. So okay. minus BTV, it would be much lower than this. That's right. Uh, alaikum. They just alaikum. I have a question for uh, you, Dr. Saif. I see that you have only the left lung uh, and you calculated also the left lung minus BTV. Uh, do you uh, calculate uh, the dose for both lungs minus PTV or only the uh, uh, the contralateral, uh, the epsilateral lung, as we have here uh, a central mass in the mediastinum? Yeah, yeah, we do both. I just I didn't present it because the way we plan this uh, patient is there is very minimal dose went to the to the right lung, so that's why I focus here to present just the dose to the left lung. But if you do bilateral lung, it's also the P20 is uh, much lower. But usually, yes, as a standard, we do both. We, uh, we take the measurement for the epsilateral lung minus the BTV. And also we do the bilateral lung as this is like the standard for the, the toxicity, uh, the expected toxicity from the treatment. Uh, uh, safe, since the patient uh, old, 70 plus, and you are at the Salim Ashari from the same center. Why didn't go with the hypofractionation for this guy? His performance was good. Like he's good, Stephanie. Uh, well, I will use any hypofractionation in GBM and also lung cancer if it is more than 70. Actually, 30 visits to the hospital, six weeks, 
is too much for those people if the same end result. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what I will change in my practice, by the way, from today. Uh, after I hear from Salem and uh, Al Jibab, really it was interesting. I'm treating nowadays the patient, he's 70, and he's an excellent, but I, I wish I treated him in a hypofractionated way, really. Uh, totally agree. I think one of the, the reasons, Dr. Adnan, is uh, this guy as like a potential surgical uh, candidate after radiotherapy. So okay. the plan was, yeah, they, they were thinking about surgery as well to be introduced uh, after uh, assessment after the radiotherapy. Excellent. Adnan, if, if you're taking the evidence, the evidence uh, does not support hyperfractionation. It's a, an institutional... Uh, Review, okay, recommendation. So, I mean, yes, you can take it with a grain of salt, I mean, depending on the performance status, depending on the patient condition. But if you talk about evidence, then 60 gray is the dose to go. Exactly. But I like to treat the old people shorter fractionation because I, I wish they complete the treatment. That's all. It will, it will be available soon, Dr. Amri. As as uh, single institutional yes. review or as an it randomized trial? Like, there, are, uh, there are several trials now talking about hyperfractionation, even with chemotherapy as well. Salim Shahri will share the evidence with us uh, soon, inshallah. Um, uh, yeah. By the way, uh, even Dr. Adnan, uh, hyperfractionation is not that uh, you just need to be cautious about the volume. Oh, yeah, don't worry. Uh, actually, the volume exactly like the case presenting now. That's Maybe. why I want to treat him with this uh, hyperfraction. Of course. Excellent case. Thank you. Okay. So after the chemo rod, this is just the follow-up after the chemo radiations. This is the lung window. So minimal shrinkage. There is some cavitation, minimal shrinkage on the primary. Uh, but we look uh, at the mediastinal window. So in the mediastinal window, the lymph node actually shrunk a lot. So it's almost disappeared. Excellent. So at this stage, what's the next step? Would you go for uh, like PET after to confirm that it is positive, would you give him just more time and then reassess? Uh, maybe he, the chemorad is enough. Would you take him to the surgery? Uh, when was the CT scan after the completion of the treatment? Immediately? Weeks, this, six weeks? this is around like more than four weeks, I think five weeks. Okay. Why, Habibi, five weeks? Why, Habibi, five weeks? I think it was just uh, logist I mean logistic problem but usually we keep it before but to be uh, yeah, me honest about this case no it was more than four weeks uh, because the, Dr. Khattan he mentioned two two weeks or three weeks uh, no no for two weeks, weeks for full month and surgery four. between three and four yeah, yeah. Dr. Prof. Khattan uh, sometimes, sometimes, uh, any as a team, uh, Prof. Jazia, sometimes uh, if we're not any uh, exactly sure about the patient performance, sometimes Prof. Jazia proceed with the divunumab for a period of time and then he push it for surgery. But this is totally off evidence, sir. Huh? Now, yes, you have a good, a good guy, like good performance. Uh, result of chemorad is excellent, but in the primary, it wasn't as good as on the lymph nodes. Uh, so would you push, would you wait? I would uh, consult with the surgeon, although they have yeah, any concerns because it's been five weeks. So let's say it's three weeks. Okay, for the three weeks, session. yes, to, okay. to make it easier, yeah. To make it easy. Uh, you have a good response on the lymph node, but uh, minimal response on the primary. So what would the surgeon uh, say? I'm not a surgeon, but I will restage the patient. I will biopsy. Is Prof. Khatan around? Go ahead, Babusa. 
probably I would do I would probably I will do a bit to make sure uh, that there is nothing and if the pet is okay I will do a lobectomy but it would be definitely very difficult for lymphadenectomy at this site especially after radiotherapy very difficult um, uh, five weeks is a bit uh, difficult especially that you will not book the patient directly so probably we'll wait for another two weeks so we're going to do the patient on almost like seven weeks and this is it will be not that difficult to do the, the lobectomy but it will be extreme difficult to reach that area and do the lymphadenectomy which is a part of actually it has to be done uh, as a complete treatment a complete staging post-op Jeff, what was the plan on the tumor board when this patient presented initially? Initially, they will go with uh, a kind of definitive chemo rad. And if the response, I mean, he didn't like it a good response. There is also uh, the surgery wasn't uh, off the table. Because May as I, I ask that question? Yeah. Um, was the plan of surgery, I, I think you answered it partially, but was the plan of surgery as a part of initial measurement, I mean, did we discuss it that you will give a new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy followed by the possibility of surgery or no, just go for chemotherapy because the patient is not fit? No, the patient was fit, but as you mentioned, uh, uh, the station five, this big lymph node locations and size, so they weren't happy to take him like as, as directly, I like as operable patient at this time. But uh, usually we go with, uh, it is a new adjuvant, but the same as definitive chemo rad. And based on, the, based on the result after, so we can decide either, decide either to go for uh, completions of the treatment with surgery or uh, the chemo rad is uh, like done the job and it's, uh, that's it. So that's, so that's the reason why you did the CT after four, five weeks, am I right? Because the surgery was not on an option in the table, right? Uh, yes, it was uh, for, okay. for the lymph node. Uh, they were like questioning, like if they can uh, get this lymph node out uh, completely uh, with uh, negative margin and everything. So uh, as a surgeon, probably I will give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, I know the decision was at the beginning. I don't want to say wrong, but... Some people will find it difficult to do that kind of surgery, but uh, I will go for a lobectomy and I'll try my best without uh, injuring the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is located in that area and take as much as I possible lymph node. But again, I will do the restaging uh, with, um, with a PET CT before the surgery. Okay. So do you have a PET scan, say? I don't have PET scan after that. They just stage uh, the body, like the, the whole body, but no PET, because also, as uh, uh, we mentioned, that more delay will, uh, will get more complication of the surgery and the PET booking will be difficult to, to get at the same time. So the dis discussions and decision at the tumor board, the tumor board was to go with surgery and with the information we have. So okay. he'd, been he'd been operated on, and they did lobotomy and dissections of the node and sampling of the other node. And uh, the tumor was two centimeters, but without any viable, two viable cells there. Also, the station five lymph node been removed, and there wasn't any viable uh, cancer there. So he was uh, resected completely, and it was uh, T0, N0. Uh, after after the surgery, complete pathological response. Great. Complete in both. I had a question. Aside from you know the typical superior sulcus pancos tumor, is trimodality? Is there strong evidence for trimodality therapy? I think Dr. Ruiz uh, presented some of the data there that. Uh, one local therapy would be sufficient. Agree, yes. Uh, at least uh, for the most part, uh, N2 with, with, or T4 disease, uh, 
the survival uh, wouldn't matter a lot with the addition of uh, surgery. Uh, the the long-term survival, for example, in the uh, Pacific trial, at four years, you have almost 50% of patients alive. Uh, this is an unprecedented result, even with the surgery. Did this patient receive immunotherapy, by the way, safe? That would be the next questions. Would you give him immunotherapy after? I don't think there is evidence to support that. Part of the benefit of immunotherapy is uh, when it is given with the uh, radiotherapy. Radiotherapy has an uh, immunomodulatory effect. It enhances antigen presentation and also overexpression of PDL1. So if you give it in the uh, adjuvant setting when you resected the whole tumor, the benefit is questionable. There was trial evaluating adjuvant immunotherapy in different solid tumor didn't uh, really add much. Uh, however, there are ongoing trial evaluating chemoimmunotherapy in the new adjuvant. And we don't have long-term data, but the results are uh, promising. So in the adjuvant setting, I don't think uh, there will be any rule. If he is EGFR positive, then uh, osimertinib should be considered. Do you have the molecular testing on him, uh, Seth, from the uh, biopsy he had? No. The sample wasn't enough, I mean, for at that time. And after surgery, as you see, it was all negative. So he's in CR. Maybe they wouldn't find anything. Yep. Mm. And the biopsy, I mean. And the biopsy, it wasn't uh, enough for the, I mean, genetics. OK. Mm. So what happened to him? Uh, I mean, the decision was on the tumor board not to give him any, uh, I mean, immunotherapy afterward. Uh, based on that's a complete response. And as uh, Dr. Royce mentioned, it is not the standard as this patient receives surgery. It is not a chemorad only. So the uh, decision was just to go for follow-up with, uh, with this patient. So that brings the question uh, regarding the biopsy. So when you are doing a biopsy uh, as an interventional radiologist, you really need to think about, you know, the molecular testing nowadays because it is uh, a major part in the treatment plan. And having one core, okay, is not enough to uh, supplement the pathologist with enough material to do all these testing. So is, this is something for us to, um, you know, uh, remind our interventional radiology colleagues that, you know. We really need more than one core because now molecular testing is becoming a standard in, in uh, lung cancer. Okay, so uh, any question to say regarding the case, the management, anything, uh, anyone would do anything different? Uh, I have a question. Please. Suppose that the um, PET CT post uh, uh, treatment, new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, chemo radiotherapy came positive. What's next? A primary or nodal? Huh? Primary or nodal disease? No, 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 no. Suppose that the lymph node, the one that we have, section five, post chemotherapy, still positive, still highlight. What you will do next? What you will do different? Will you push the patient for surgery? Will you con consider the patient for concurrent chemo radiotherapy? Will you uh, biopsy and give a target therapy? Or uh, what next for everybody? Just a question. Very interesting question. Uh, Safe? For me, I mean, uh, the timing of, of the images, uh, I mean, the decision to me, as we mentioned before, has to be from the beginning, if we if we think it is like chemorad, then it is chemorad. The timing of the image is, is different because if I do it in five weeks and it's positive, that's fine. It doesn't mean that the patient doesn't uh, he doesn't respond. 
so uh, he need more time to show me the response so i will i will not push him for surgery if i decided from the beginning this is like a chemo when it is uh, well, in this case in this case in this case beginning. yeah in this case if it come uh, uh, positive and the patient is as good this patient with good performance so i will i will push for surgery even with a single lymph node involvement into disease because that shows actually is a poor prognosis. If you go for surgery after chemo, radiotherapy, and it will not make a big difference between giving him a concurrent chemo radiotherapy or giving him surgery with the lymphadenectomy. It's still, it's a systemic disease. Can somebody correct me if I'm wrong? Well, the problem here is the dose they used uh, at the beginning is a definitive radical dose. So a patient already received 60 gray uh, to the uh, mediastinum and to the lung. Uh, so more radiation is not possible. Uh, what about chemo? Will you change the chemotherapy? Will you give him a target yes. therapy? Will you give something? Else? Because apparently yes. he's an into disease. So he would not have that, I mean, uh, five-year survival rate as you expected with an upper loop uh, respond lymph node. You got my mean? You got what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. I mean, so it, will you give him a second line chemotherapy or will go for a target therapy? Radiotherapy is out because you already give him a complete good treatment. I mean, we, we will consider him now unresectable and then he will be a uh, candidate for uh, the Valumab. Isn't that right? Yes, that's what I want to reach. So there will be no more surgery. That's why staging is very important after such giving him a treatment. Even if the, um, the PET CT did not show, you still need to have histological diagnosis for the patient outcome. I totally agree. السلام عليكم. السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. تحياتي للجميع من الإمارات خالد بلارج. يا هلا دكتور خالد حياك الله. حبيبي الله يسعدك فيك. الله يحفظك. قول في نور أنا جاي من الإمارات. سلامي للأولد بيبل الشبان والجميع الشباب اللي موجودين. <تصفيق> سؤالي سؤالي لأحمد أحمد حبيبي إف إيه أحمد بابوسا. the skill of the surgeon makes any difference in the outcome of such patients and uh, if the other uh, outcome will be different if or X or Y and Z surgeon operate in this patient and what is the limit to maintain the skill uh, of thoracic surgeon uh, annually and a total number of uh, operation in order to say that the thoracic surgeon maintain their skill. I know from radical prostatectomy according to Royal College, we need at least uh, 20 cases uh, of radical surgery to maintain the skill of the surgeon. So what's the scenario here? أول شيء كيف صحتك إيش أخبارك وحشتنا يا حلو الله يسعدك حبيبي كلكم وحشتوا it was this was mentioned for esophagectomy as well 20 cases per 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 year in thoracic surgery I don't think I came across about it now for most of the surgeons are actually skilled what you need to do is basically a lobectomy will be straightforward. It's the art of the lymphadenectomy. And that's why I was talking about making this patient go into that nerve space at the aortopulmonary window to take that lymph node in a post radiation. It can be easy, but it can be catastrophic. Involvement of the, of the uh, uh, um, lymph node, uh, sorry, the nerve going to uh, the larynx, uh, from the Vegas branch and you involve in that area with radiation and you cut it, you will make a hill of a patient post up from um, aspiration. He cannot cough and, and that's a major problem. That lymph node is really in, in an odd positions, but it's easy to take it without radiation. Um, lobectomy by itself, an upper lobectomy is an easy procedure for people who's uh, doing it frequently. I don't have a number, um, but nowadays we are actually even getting an experience with the video assisted thoracoscopy and 
uh, we basically open a thoracotomy for those who have no experience. They open a thoracotomy, make the wound open, and then proceed with the video assisted thoracoscopy and instrument. And once he's done, he closes it without put a rip spreader. Um, if not, and if he had any complication, immediately he is above on the arteries and he could control it. I hope I could answer your question. Nice to hear from you, uh, Habibi Allah Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Khalid, uh, for the comment and the question. Saif, uh, do you still have any more slides? No, I think the time is, uh, I have another case, but it, it, it isn't as interesting as, yeah, as this case. Yeah, very interesting. It was a very, very interesting case and a very, very, uh, you know, uh, valuable comment from everybody. I think, yeah, uh, the time uh, we have, uh, all the time we have. And now I will uh, pass it on to Dr. Ibrahim al -Atin. Oh, sorry, Dr. Majid al -Ghamdi. Much of it, Dr. Ibrahim. So thank you very much for all the, uh, uh, those who uh, were able to make it for our conference today. Uh, to all the speakers, all the uh, uh, moderators, uh, special thanks uh, to the uh, uh, to our special guests uh, from thoracic surgery, uh, Dr. Prof. Uh, Khaled Gattan and uh, Dr. Ahmed Bamusa. Your presence were very uh, appreciated. So thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Uh, this was really enjoyable meeting. And we uh, also would like to thank the uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Munir, uh, Mr. Ahmed Munir, uh, and all the people from AstraZeneca for sponsoring this event. And hopefully, we'll have more of uh, such conferences in the in the future. Bismillah. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you, doctors. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thank night. You. Bye. Please make it frequent. It's very nice. Helpful. I'm ready. I'm ready, doctor. I'm ready. We can, we, we can identify another date right now. I'm ready. Thank you. 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 Thank you.